Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Rebencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. There was a big scare at Yellowstone National Park last week, where a throng of visitors, possibly as many as 50, crowded in around a bull bison not far from the old faithful geyser. The bison, not surprisingly, took exception to the crowd, charged it, and sent a nine-year-old Florida girl somersaulting through the air. Fortunately, she avoided serious injury. Our own Rebecca Latson also outlined how to spend three glorious days at Stahegan in the North Cascades National Park Complex and fossilized dinosaur remains found at Big Bend National Park 35 years ago have turned out to be a new species. You can find these and other stories about the parks at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, Erica Zambello takes a look at how two bird species, the California condor and snail kites, are faring in the national park system. I travel to the Scudic Peninsula of Acadia National Park to talk with scientist Hannah Weber about her work with rockweed on the rocky coastline. And we end this episode with a look at a new book that views a visit to a national park as going home. I'm Erica Zambello, and this week we are talking about raptors. Raptors, put simply, are birds of prey. Think eagles or hawks. In the 1950s, their numbers plummeted as a result of DDT and other pesticides. Luckily, after these chemicals were banned, the populations made a resurgence. Still, many species are still struggling with human disturbance and ramifications from human development. The national parks provide critical wildlife habitat and national park staff are critical in monitoring these species as well as actually helping their populations become more resilient. So today we are talking to staff at Zion National Park as well as an ornithologist who monitors the Everglades to learn more about the California condor and the Everglades snail kite. Today, I'm talking to park ranger Eugene Moisa about some big bird news coming out of Zion National Park. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, Erica. The big news this past month is that they have discovered the 1,000th chick of the California condor species. Now, I know why that is a huge deal because I'm a huge um, bird raptor nerd. I love condors. I love vultures. I've read a whole book about the, the California condor. But for people who have never heard of that before, or maybe only heard of it in passing, what exactly is a California condor? Absolutely. A condor is a new world vulture. It's a scavenger. It's one of the largest birds in North America. It's typically, you can see it's large black wings that can span up to nine and a half feet. They have white patches underneath their wings that you can spot when you're looking up to them. And so how big are we talking about a California condor versus like the everyday turkey vulture that someone would see, you know, as they're driving down the highway? Oh, so, um, definitely larger than turkey vulture. Their, their body length can be about 50 or so inches. Um, their weight is about 20 pounds. Wow. Um, so it's it's noticeably difference between a between a turkey vulture and a California condor. And that, I mean that's a big bird. That's birds are usually very light. So a California condor must have to eat a lot of um, different carcasses and refuse in order to keep that that weight up. Absolutely, they do a great job. So <laughs> yeah, they're they're nature's um, very helpful garbage cleaners. So we appreciate them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so they're nesting in your national park. You know, what is their nesting like? Where are they in your park? And what does Zion look like and feel like for someone who's never been there? Um, they are nesting in our national park, and they're absolutely wonderful to have. They are adding a great tourist spot there for, for visitors. Um, they... Or, so one of the big features for, for our national park is the geological formations that we have contained within our boundaries. So 
and a big part of that is going to be the the large walls or cliffs of Navajo sandstones that that are prominent here in the national park here at Zion. And so we are so the, and that also serves as a great area for for our condors to be able to to dwell or inhabit. Um, the pair that we have here have chosen a nest site that's just north of Angel's Landing, which is a very popular trail in our park. Um, but because of its location, biologists think that it's actually a, a prime nesting site for for successful uh, breeding and possibly fledgling there in the future. Awesome. And I, I looked at the picture on your website. You know, it's this small crevice that looks like it's very high up in these you know, very, very steep cliffs. How do your biologists even find these nests? They do a lot of monitoring. Um, so the California Condor Recovery Program, they have a lot of the condors, if not all of them, are going to be tagged and have a radio transmitter. And so our biologists have the equipment to tune in and be able to locate the, the condors. So they could, something could trigger something that they are monitoring that and they, they realize that there's condors in the area. Um, the way we found out about the our current pair of condors is that we noticed that they were, well, there's a condor 409. That's the female condor. And she tends to stay around the area. Um, and then she we noticed that she had a new mate, a new male condor there that was with her. Um, and so they were hanging around a specific area and it wasn't until, um, well, we noticed that they were, they were switching on and off to a specific location. Um, and so that is what tr helped trigger our, our biologists to realize that they, they may have produced a, uh, an egg and, and we kept on monitoring them. And then we realized that it was, it was continuing. Yay. Well, that's great news. And so, you know, you have this chick that's really high up, you know, you're monitoring it with, you know, binoculars and scopes and all that good stuff. So I kind of have two questions for you. You know, what does this chick look like? Because I don't know what a baby condor, you know, looks like. And then second of all, why are we all so excited about, you know, California condor chick number 1000? Absolutely. The a California condor chick is, is not going to be the prettiest bird out there, um, but they are, they definitely have their unique beauty to them because they um, come out and they come out of an, of the egg, but they're, they're just like most babies are a little quirky. The California condor chick is going to be um, light colored. Um, how do I say it? The best thing is, they look a little funky and they're, they're, um, uh, what's, what's the good way to say that they're, they're just, they're not the prettiest birds is I think, uh, um, they kind of look like dinosaurs. <laughs> exactly. They're kind of, um, <laughs> that's a good way to say it. Kind of like dinosaurs. They're, they're just like have their own unique beauty to them in their sense. Well, good. I'm glad that you find them, find them beautiful. I do. <laughs> and so the 1,000th, that's very hard for me to say, the 1,000th chick is very important because, I mean, this species almost went extinct, right? Yes. In the early 80s, the, there was about 22 condors left. Um, and so in that, that triggered um, for them to be able to be captured and relocated and Really wasn't until probably about a decade after in the early 90s um, that a condor recovery program was really initiated. And, and that's when we can start. That's when they started tracking the condors and, and their uh, mortality rate um, and really making big efforts to be able to help the condors come back because they were they were almost gone. And so to you, as this 1,000th chick is born at Zion, I mean, do you have hope for their future? Are they successfully nesting? They are successfully nesting. Um, the female condor, 409, she's, she's nested here prior, uh, about two times before, before our current uh, chick. And so, but the previous two 
the chicks didn't fledge correctly. So they didn't fly out of the nest correctly. Oh, um, and so, so we're really hopeful um, to be able to have this, this chick fledge correctly um, so that it can join the population, of course, but then also uh, be a successful 1,000th chick for the program. And so we're, we're super excited. We keep our eyes. We are constantly monitoring the nest in the area. Uh, we know that's going to happen, or we predict or our best estimate really is going to be that it's going to be in November. Um, from That's about six months um, after it's hatched. Okay. And so we're we're definitely keeping a close eye on 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 their on that little chick for for a successful fledge there, but it's it's a united effort between so many organizations and citizens to be able to have the success of of this to be able to reach this milestone really of a thousand chick. There's about five hundred um, condors that are 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 alive that are part of the population. Um, about 250 or so, about half of the 500 are, are flying free. And we're super excited that we can host and be a refuge for, for a few of the condors, a couple of the condors here that, um, that can nest here and, and be wild and free and, and do their thing. So the California condors nest in Zion because it has the perfect cliffs for nesting. There's obviously enough food for the parents to survive as well as the chick. So how do the national parks work as part of a partnership to help the preservation and resilience of this very unique species? So Zion National Park, where we, we get to play a part in, in this larger scope of, of effort to be able to help increase the, the numbers of the, of the condor. Um, we are excited and, and we're here to be able to provide a refuge for, for condors and other uh, flora and fauna, and so, but to be a part of the condor recovery program um, in any small way is is truly a, a a benefit to us to be able to to be a part of something bigger than us, um, and so we are ecstatic to be able to keep eyes on and really help monitor the the pair of condors and their chick, and so, but it's a large scale effort to be able to. Bring, its, bring the condor's numbers up um, from state, local, federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, private citizens. We've all come together to be able to really keep this at the forefront and, and continue to help the condor's population increase. Well, that's awesome. And it's such good news to hear about the 1,000th chick. And we will definitely catch up with you guys in November and see how it goes and maybe check in on some of your other condors. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us for this special on how the national parks are help helping our favorite raptor species. <laughs> it has been a big pleasure, Erica. Have a good day. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donor support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. So we just talked about California condors with Zion National Park. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about snail kites in Everglades National Park with Snail Kite Conservation Coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Tyler Beck. Tyler, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. So I heard about your interest and your job in snail kite research 
when we were both doing a natural resources leadership program in Florida. But I was just curious, you know, this is a very specific type of research. So how did you become interested in snail kites? Well, I, I really became interested in snail kites uh, in graduate school when I was doing research in both the natural Everglades system and in some construction wetlands that are meant to reduce nutrient runoff from polluting the Everglades. So it was really inter interesting to me that a bird that had been critically endangered and at this point was at its lowest population estimate ever was able to use both natural systems that, and those that we were using to try to restore the, the natural system that are very artificial themselves. Um, later, I, I was working uh, doing habitat restoration or wetland restoration on Lake Okeechobee, uh, which is the largest freshwater lake in the southeastern United States. Um, and the marsh there had been greatly degraded by water level mismanagement and nutrient pollution. However, what we were seeing was that snail kites were really responding positively to our management and restoration activities in a positive way. So that really encouraged us that we were doing things in the right direction. So if you're not familiar with the species, snail kite is obviously a very funny species name. So what exactly is a snail kite? You know, they're only found in Florida, but why are they only found in Florida? So the snail kite is a medium-sized raptor similar to a hawk. Uh, the females and juveniles are kind of a mottled brown and beige colored, and the males are a solid gray color. And unlike most other raptors that we think of as eating very fast moving preys and, and, and having to catch things that are difficult to catch, snail kites only uh, feed on these large aquatic snails. <laughs> really? Yeah, so they, they catch a very slow moving thing that shouldn't be hard to catch, except for they're, they are hard to catch because they're hard to see and you can only catch them when they come to the surface. And they're also very hard to extract from their shells. And, and the snail kites have these very specialized adaptations. They have very long talons on their feet and a very hooked bill for extracting the snail out of its shell. And because of their specialized diet, they're very dependent on the wetlands where these snails live. Uh, they also live in South and Central America and Cuba, but in the United States, they're only found regularly in Florida. And uh, they're considered a geographically isolated population, which is why they're designated as endangered. Okay, I got you. So these Florida snail kites don't mix with the Central and South American snail kites, so that's why they're endangered here. And they're not like diving in the water for like an osprey for the snails. They're waiting for them to come to the surface and then they're plucking them out. Exactly. These, these snails have gills, but their gills don't work all that well. And a lot of times the wetlands that they're in are kind of low in oxygen. So the snails often come up to the surface to breathe. And they also have to lay their eggs above the surface of the water and they're vulnerable to being caught by the snail kites at that point. Okay, so I basically consider Florida just like one giant wetland, but they're not found everywhere in Florida, right? No, they're primarily found uh, basically from Orlando South, uh, just south of Orlando, there's the Kissimmee chain of lakes wetlands. Uh, it's a series of lakes and then there's Kissimmee River that flows into Lake Okeechobee, they're found there as well. And then throughout the Everglades system and then the headwaters of the uh, St. John's River. Uh, but other than that, they're not found throughout Florida, at least regularly. Okay, so I'm guessing that their limited range is one of the reasons that their populations were in decline, but I have a sneaking suspicion that humans probably had a role to play in that too, right? Yes, we did. Um, they're, they've suffered from a lot of habitat degradation. You know, we, We've altered the hydrologic cycles of a lot of these wetlands. We polluted them with primarily with nutrients. So the, the primary cause of, of their endangered status is uh, what man has done to, to the wetlands. And then we've also went through a couple series of droughts that really hammered the population because of the poor conditions of, of their habitat. Okay, and so, I mean, those are pretty big things, you know, like droughts and things like that. So what are we doing to help them rebound? You've mentioned a few things, but what's kind of the overarching picture of what we're doing to help this particular species? Well, we're doing a lot of big things. We're doing a lot of more nutrient control, watching what's going into our wetlands. We're restoring a lot of these, these uh, wetland habitats. Um, you know, holding more water on the land before it goes into wetlands is, is helping. 
And the, there's a big project called the Com Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan that's that's restoring a more natural flow to the Everglades that, that's helping. Um, but we're also being helped out by the invasion of an exotic apple snail uh, that they can also eat as well. It's giving them another food source. Okay, so an invasive snail came in, so they are able to eat more than just the one species that they historically ate. Exactly. Right. But, but this is this is a snail that's native to South America where they also have snail kites. So it's not... Oh, 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 okay. Well, I'm glad a uh, Florida invasive species is finally having a positive benefit. <laughs> it's about time, right? So, you know, you work for the FWC, which is a state-level organization, but I was just curious, how does this particular species, the snail kite, depend on land that's within the national park system? So Everglades National Park is definitely a part of their core nesting area. Uh, it's just adjacent to some other state-owned lands where we see a lot of snail kites nesting. And right now, currently, we only see about a handful of snail kite nests in Everglades National Park, but just to the north in the water conservation areas, where the, the water is more impounded, there's more water, um, we do see a, quite a few snail kite nests there. Okay. Now, with the, comp with the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, the goal is to get more natural uh, timing, uh, quantity, and location of water flows into Everglades National Park. And I'm sure that when we get those restored flows, that we'll, we'll, we will see more snail kite nesting in Everglades National Park. Okay, so it is dependent on this wider management plan, you know, that also in turn depends on federal funding. So it's a lot of things that have to kind of happen for the snail kite to expand its nests in the Everglades. Yeah, it's a big partnership between uh, state agencies, some county agencies, a big part of it's the federal agencies and some uh, Native American tribes as well. So what can bird and wildlife lovers do to help this species? You know, maybe if they live in Florida, but, you know, maybe if they don't and they're just interested in snail kites living for, you know, forever generations. Well, if you live in Florida, um, we can do things like, you know, watching what runs off into our wetlands, you know, deal at the, you can deal at the local level, your municipalities, making sure that we're doing smart building plans that are controlling water runoff. And so if, if you don't live in Florida, or even if you do, uh, we should be voicing our, our support for these larger restoration plans, like the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. That's going to be a lot of federal dollars going to go into undoing what we did decades ago. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to us about the snail kite. It's definitely a species that we're going to keep watching. And maybe in a few years when the management plan is farther down the road, we can check back and see how they're doing. That sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to our two guests for talking to us about the California condor and the Everglades snail kite. This is Erica from Northwest Florida. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. I'm out on the Skudik Peninsula of Acadia National Park with Hannah Weber, the Marine Ecology Director for the Skudik Institute. And we've been looking at some of her research here on the rocky coastline fronting Frenchman Bay. And it revolves around rockweed, which to most of us is just seaweed. Hannah's research goes into the foundational aspects of what makes rockweed an ecological engineer on the coastline here. So Hannah, could you go into that a little bit deeper what exactly do you mean by rockweed is a foundational species? Sure. 
Thanks. Um, so we call something like rockweed, Ascophyllum a foundation species in that it really controls and affects what the environment where it is, how that environment works. So the light intensity in this location or the temperature or the way the water moves. Um, a foundation species is just something that's going to control the environment where it is. And in terms of here on the rocky coastline, how does rockweed do that? Sure. So the neat thing about the intertidal zone for people who are, don't live near the ocean is the area that is exposed at low tide and is completely covered by the ocean at high tide. And here in the Gulf of Maine, we have some really good tides and that the ones around here are about 10, 12 feet. So between high tide and low tide, we've got a lot of space that's exposed. And at high tide, everything is, is in the ocean and it's bathed by beautiful ocean water. But at low tide, it's just on the rock and exposed to the sun beating down on it in the summer or in the winter, it's exposed to freezing cold temperatures and ice. And when you have a species like rockweed in the mix there, well, rockweed really kind of at low tide protects all of the organisms underneath it. The rockweed can lose about 97% of its water content at low tide, and it's baking and it's broiling in the sun at low tide in the summer. But if you feel underneath, you'll feel that it's moist and cool under the rockweed and the organisms that live under there, snails, crabs, barnacles um, can really, they can handle that moisture and that coolness. Whereas if the rockweed weren't there, they wouldn't be there because they really can't handle that drying out or that heat. And then in the winter time when we've got icing conditions and we've got freezing cold, again, if you stuck your hand, if you were crazy enough to be in the intertidal in the winter, you stuck your hand under the rockweed, the top of the rockweed would be frozen. And underneath it would still be pliable and it would be um, not as cold, the difference isn't as significant in the winter, but it wouldn't be as cold and it wouldn't be frozen under there. Everything would still be malleable and it would still be a, an okay place to exist. So, so basically it, it serves as an insulator of sorts. Yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. It's sort of this nice refuge and that's at low tide and at high tide. It's an algae, which means that it's not even closely related to plants. People think of it as a plant, it's not. And we're more related to mushrooms than algae are to trees, but I'm gonna go with a, a tree um, uh, metaphor here because I think it helps people. So if the rockweed, if the tide is in, then the rockweed is sort of standing up in the water and it's acting like an underwater tree in that it's controlling light that comes through to sort of through the canopy, the algal canopy to the to the floor of the inner tidal. And so anything that's living under there has to be able to deal with low light temperatures. And it also affects the way the water moves, sort of like if you were in a forest, although algae is not a plant, if you were in a forest and it were a blizzard, you would be in an area of calm wind movement in the forest whereas if you stepped out you'd be blasted well the same thing happens with the inner tidal um, if you have rockweed or any of these other algae that exist in the inner tidal you wouldn't have such strong water motion instead it would really kind of ameliorate the way the water moves through there too hmm. so what type of creatures seek harbor in rockweed sure at at low tide, it's crabs, it's snails, it's barnacles that live there, it's blue mussels, which are so delicious. Um, at high tide, there are a number of different species of fish that will forage and also seek shelter, especially when they're really small. So pollock, cod, um, rock gunnels, and then we get um, some of our um, non-invasive crabs, so the Jonah crabs and the rock crabs, as well as the occasional lobster and American eel. So there are a number of species that do take advantage of, of this algae being in the intertidal zone. Mm -hmm. And as far as some of your research, it, it kind of goes towards, um, maybe I'm wrong, but some of the aspects that, that rockweed can be used in commercially? So rockweed, so we just, 
not only as this sort of ecosystem engineer or this foundation species that really influences what the inner tidal looks like and acts like, but it's also a harvestable resource and it's used in a bunch of fertilizer products, a bunch of animal feed supplements or animal feed products. It's also used in a bunch of different pharmaceuticals and it's, you know, alginates are extracted from it that can be used as thickeners. So it's got a whole host of commercial um, um, properties as well that can be used in a bunch of different applications. Um, and so my research to understand the ecological role of rockweed is really in light of, of harvest and harvest practices. What does sustainable harvest look like? What happens to those, those foundation aspects when we harvest? Rockweed is harvested such that the whole alga isn't taken. Um, harvesters leave about a 40 centimeter um, part of the of the rockweed behind and that regrows. Um, it changes what it looks like when it regrows. It grows sort of more bushy than it had been before. And so when we have this foundation species, but it's also harvested, how does harvest impact that foundation aspect? And then when it regrows and it looks sort of bushier instead of more um, tree-like, again it's an algae, but um, how does that influence like the fish that swim in and out of it? How does it influence how it controls temperature and light and moisture and wave motion? So that's sort of where my research is at. Mm -hmm. And you've got a number of, of sensors out here on the, the rocks um, measuring a, a whole multitude of things I imagine, but, but certainly um, temperature. Yeah, so cool thing. So also we're really, again, I work for Scudic and we're very grateful to the park for being, um, for, for being here for researchers. The nice thing about working in the park is that this is a protected space. And so I don't have to worry about, um, things happening to this space as a, as a research site. And that's exceptionally good for researchers of, of a lot of different strands of, of research. But I do have a bunch of sensors out in the inner tidal zone that are measuring light intensity and temperature and water motion. But the temperature ones are interesting. Here in the Gulf of Maine, we are, the Gulf is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the ocean. And so we've sort of asked some questions with our temperature sensors. I don't have the, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but to say with our temperature centers and sensors in the inner tidal zone, can we detect ocean heat waves? Can we use, my sensors are here to understand rockweed, but they can serve these other purposes. And so can we use the data that we're getting to pick up that, that signature of an ocean heat wave? Because these sensors are not terrifically expensive. They're easy for us to look at the data almost in real time. And so that can be a powerful tool for us to work with collaborators throughout the Gulf of Maine to really understand how the Gulf of Maine is changing by just walking down to the shore, picking up our sensors, and really digging into our data that we have collected, you know, right here. But that's what we're trying to understand. Can we use these sensors to look at larger patterns along the Gulf of Maine and feed into some of these larger data sets to see if we can contribute to the larger questions of how is the Gulf of Maine changing? Nice, nice. We've been talking with Hannah Weber. She's the Marine Ecology Director for the Scudic Institute which um, is located in Acadia National Park on the Scudic Peninsula and a beautiful place to have to work every day. Thanks so much for your time, Hannah. Hey, thank you, Kurt. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. 
As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy to tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. What do you expect when you enter a national park? Why do we visit these places? I know I head into the national park system to be amazed by the scenery and wildlife, to enjoy the recreational opportunities that abound there, and to relax, to be rejuvenated. For Evan Turk, an artist who was introduced to national parks by his father, going into the parks is like going home. In a new book out this summer, You Are Home, an Ode to the National Parks, Turk blends his beautiful paintings of settings from across the national park system with short passages connecting all living creatures to these landscapes. To the chipmunk in her burrow, sleeping beneath the leaves to keep warm. To the resilient bison in the steaming oasis of an endless winter, you are home. To the constellations of blinking fireflies in the warm summer nights, you are home. Beneath the soaring doorways of stone and peaks that pierce the ceiling of clouds within the corridors of ancient breathing trunks of trees and the teeming reefs of the ocean floor, you are home. It's not hard to see that Turk is connecting us with Yellowstone, Great Smoky Mountains, Arches, Haleakala, Sequoia, and Biscayne National Parks. Throughout his colorful book, the artist draws connections to 23 of the national parks, Connections that tell us we're home. And why not? It's fitting. Many of us want to make the parks, or a specific park in particular, our home. To wrap us in the setting, the wildness, the solitude that can be found there. Turk concludes his book with a message about the incredible landscapes that are within the national park system. And the power and ambition and inspiration that flows from them. And he makes clear that the parks are for all of us, no matter our race, our gender, or our ethnicity. You'll have to excuse him for getting on his soapbox, for he believes in the collective good all cultures and races bring to the United States. National parks, he writes, protect the idea of a United States that can grow to become better than its beginnings, to become inclusive of all the nation's history and diversity, They protect spaces where the most valuable seeds of this country's future can be sown for its next generations. They preserve the limitless potential of the countless astronomers, geologists, poets, artists, athletes, and people of all kinds who come to feel the power of the places we all call home, and that is worth preserving. There was a time not too long ago when the relevancy of the national parks was questioned. Today, they are perhaps more relevant than ever. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We look forward to your thoughts and ideas and suggestions for future shows. You can reach us at news at nationalparkstraveler.org. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. 
This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.